design strategist, professor. Can you say it one more time? Professor. <laughs> Such an authority that she's teaching other people? What? Anyway, based out of Toronto. So but before, before we get into actually talking about who she is, let's take it back. Let's take it way, way back. When pole cuts were a thing, when Sunny D wasn't a vodka seltzer, <laughs> and when well, YTV had a, another TV as a co-host, but it was covered in bubble gum. Anyways. <laughs> anyway, so we go back. We go back to church. We grew up in church, and, it, and you know the vibe if you grew up in a church, right? You're clapping and swaying, like Stevie Wonder was your uncle, you know? <laughs> and we've come a long, long way. We've come a long, long way. So over the last 10 years, um, June has created and led impactful campaigns, built online presences, and curated in-person experiences. She's, she's generating revenue, shifting brand, brand op opinions, meeting fundraising goals, and sparking conversations, creating long-lasting relationships with consumers at home and abroad. Her client list is long. Honestly, I'm too long. I don't want to say it, but I'll put Anyway, it's UNICEF, Lincoln, YMCA, Denton, Sport Health, Artura, Wines, Main Good Foods, uh, Dea Geo, uh, Canada, Passion Takes Action, and Collective Arts. But yeah, that's enough of me. Let's give it up. June! As a fellow creative, we are not morning people. Um, although I only get up for two things, which is traveling and I guess work sometimes. <laughs> so there's that. Um, but yeah, I, I'm so glad to be here. I've been part of this community for a really long time. Um, I don't know if anyone has been here since the design exchange days, but yeah, I was there too. So it's really a full circle moment to be here. Thank you. Um, and yeah, I just, yeah, when I when I was asked to talk about corruption, I was like, oh, I have a bit of a history with that. Um, so you might know me from my writing about me, Charity, but we'll talk about that. Um, but also, it was a good exercise in thinking about what it actually is. And I was like, okay, we know like it's just the usual stuff, but there are other ways to think about it. Because words mean things, but they're also ambiguous. And in my class, I also, teach that you know the way that words change and all that depends on how the culture is too. And so corruption is a real big part of that. But yeah, nice to meet you. Um, a lot of you guys are from my Instagram, so you probably will see some of this stuff. <laughs> it's just easy. Um, but yeah, I, I, a friend of mine and, and I went to Happy Place, I don't think anyone remembers that, a couple years ago, and that's from there. I just love random stupid shit like that just because it's fun. And, but also like, yellow is my favorite color. Um, I love Chuck Taylors. Um, I wear Marvel stuff a lot, a lot of cartoon shirts. That's me in a photo, so it's like, that's nice to be, <laughs> essentially. Um, so yeah, when you think about corruption, you think about a couple things, like this. <laughs> like Monopoly, Rich Uncle Pennybags is the actual name. I don't know if anybody knew that. Rich Uncle Pennybags uh, from the 1930s with Parker Brothers. Do not pass go. No, 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 no. This is also a slight tribute to my brother and sister who are here. Uh, we used to play Monopoly and we make up our own rules. And sometimes my sister would cheat us out of things. And so I get corruption from each other sometimes. <laughs> sometimes I also might think about corruption like this the blue screen of death. Windows users stand up. I, um, Apple users are probably like, we don't know what that is. Our stuff works, works really well. No, you have the rainbow wheel. You have stuff too. Okay? You're not accepted to this. Uh, the blue screen of death, the corruption of your files, your system, all of that, it can be that. Especially as creatives in here, this is death for us. We do not want this, and I've experienced this far too many times to count. Um, but also, we can think about it like this, with different shows. Any succession time? Anybody? Yeah! Succession time, let's go! Um, other movies like The Big Short. I actually really love heist movies, where they like steal, either for the band or for themselves or whatever else. And, I just love that because it's just like sometimes you want to root for the bad guy because they're doing it for good reasons. <laughs> or like John Wick. Anyone see John Wick lately? Yeah, so dope movie, but you know, we're cheering on a, a guy who's killing like apparently he, over the, four, the course of the four series, he kills like 400 and some people, <laughs> which is crazy. <laughs> why are you rooting for this man? Anyway, but it's so fun, so why not? But yeah, we think about shows like this, but also we can think about. 
about it like this. Uh, I don't know if anybody remembers this from last year. Um, wait, can I use it from the clicker? Or, sorry. But then, different, you think about, my life has been 
a series of corruptions in that there are different things I thought I wanted to be. I thought I wanted to be a vet. I wanted to be a photographer. I wanted to be a skater. My sister and I both took figure skating when we were younger, and so yeah, that's me in a little dress uh, with my skates. I'm like, hey, I'm going to be the next Surrey Bonnelly. No. <laughs> no way. Although Surrey Bonnelly's the greatest. If you, know who, if you don't know who she is, look her up. Um, sometimes I love music, and sometimes definitely not like Zico because he's way too good. But I pretend to be a rapper sometimes. I hip hop for you. So I got to fulfill my dreams there. Um, and then I really, really, really want to be a diplomat. And even to the point where I went to school for international relations, I was very involved in Model UN, which is why I'm there, at, uh, sitting at in the General Assembly with where my family's from, the St. Vincent's. So that was a very proud moment. Uh, talk about diaspora kids. That was a very proud diaspora moment. Um, and then, then I realized, oh, then I'm in marketing, like working for Ford. What? How do you how do you end up here? <laughs> like it's just kind of nuts. So if if you had asked me like where I would be now, I'd be like, no, I'd just be maybe dancing or painting or whatever else. And while I kind of incorporate those things to my creative process, it's not where I thought I'd ended up. And so I want to think about our lives as you know, a multi-potential, right? I don't know if anyone's heard of this talk. I love TED Talks. Um, but one of my favorite ones, and it's someone that someone that passed on to me when we were working together, they were my mentor for a bit. Um, she sent me this video about being a multi-potential life. And it's a really good way to think about your own life in that it's a series of corruptions that don't necessarily end up, it's a way of corrupting the way you think about your own life in that you don't have to be one thing. It's not too late to change your direction. You don't have to be this one thing. You know, like the sunken cost uh, relativity theory where it's like, I put so much into this, I need to keep going. No, you don't. It's not too late to change. And it's more possible for us to do that now more than ever because even our parents were like, okay, I'm in this and I have to do this for 40, 50, 60 years. We don't have to do that. There's so many different things you can do with your life. So I would highly recommend going to Emily Wapnick's talk on YouTube, wherever else. I actually rewatch it every now and then because it's a good reminder. Um, but the multi-potential light is those with many interests, many jobs over a lifetime, and many interlocking potentials. It's a very millennial concept, actually, as an elder millennial here. Um, I, this is my, marketing is actually my second career. Um, and I, like I said, I want to be a diplomat. And I'm, yeah, I even wrote the public service exams and failed because there's too much math in it. Because math for diplomat? Diplomacy? What? You just need to talk to people. Um, but in general, I am a diplomat now because I'm still dealing with a lot of, I deal with a lot of people, I manage relationships, I back channel a lot through different processes, which is what a diplomat does. So it's like, I am one, just not the way I thought it would be, except now I just to get to take cool pictures and be on sets and things like that, which is nice. So it's a lot more interesting than actual diplomats. And actually when I was at UNICEF, one person had told me, you'd be a terrible diplomat. And I was like, kind of taken, I was like, why? And she's like, you care too much about people. And I was like, ooh. Bars. I was like, she's right. <laughs> the best diplomats don't can't care about people because they have to worry about the greater good. Anyway. So yeah, in all of that sense, my life has been a series of corruptions, for better or for worse, and yours probably has too. You definitely are not in the place that you thought you were going to be, and that's okay. Or it's not there's I can't remember, maybe it's George Elliott. I think it's the phrase that says it's not too late to be what you might have been. Um, I really live, like that phrase a lot too. Um, even I also have to say that um, as a black woman working in marketing, teaching other people, I am not supposed to be here. There are a lot of other people that see me as less than and are like, and this has been throughout my entire career too, where I've been made to feel less than, I've been prevented from promoting, I've had to move to even get to where I want to, like make sure I take care of myself before anyone else does because that's just what we have to do as black people, but especially as black women, we're the, pretty much the lowest society, and so no one tends to really care, and all of that, and so even just me breaking a lot of, I guess, generational curses, we like to say, on the internet, um, and it's very unhumble thing to say, but I'm like, I'm not really supposed to be here, and I am, and so that even just the point that I'm here is a corruption itself, because a lot of people, if you see myself on paper, they're like, and then they see me, they're like, do you? Yeah, it's me, motherfucker. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> so, corruption can, we'll go, to the, we'll go back to the first definition, which is a breach of trust, criminal corruption, all of that stuff. Some of you might know me from my writing stuff. I am also a freelance writer, although these days I'm busy with other stuff. But 
I still write, and um, a lot of, a lot of stuff I talk about is really cultural um, cultural things. But a few years ago, um, I wrote an I wrote an, a, an article about We Charity. But before we get to that, um, my start in marketing was in actually nonprofits, and I've had some of the best times of my life. I've met some very good people. I had some very good skills. That is Lisa LaFlamme, who is wonderful at parties. She's awesome. <laughs> it was an honor to get to write about her last year with, with the Dove campaign thing. Um, and that was at my first, that was actually my first role in, in um, marketing slash nonprofits at Journalists for Human Rights. Um, I helped organize their Night for Rights. And yeah, Lisa LaFlamme, a huge supporter of that. So yeah, I got to meet her, and she's pretty cool. <laughs> um, the second one was that's my that was when I was at the YMCA of Toronto. Um, I was there almost four years, and honestly, if it wasn't for the pay and the opportunities, I wouldn't have left because I really loved that job, and I I had several jobs within that organization over the many years, and got to meet a lot of. I was working a lot with younger people, and being around young people is really energizing. They have so many cool ideas. Sometimes they act like idiots, but it's great because <laughs> you guys enjoy it. But also, like you learn a lot from them because you're like, remember the uncorrupted part as a child? Like a lot of them are still uncorrupted and hopeful, and you're like, oh man, please don't lose that. Can you get jaded like me, <laughs> or just like cynical? Because I tend to be a little cynical. And then that's at UNICEF when I was doing a seminar for some university students. They insisted to take that picture. I did not want to, which is why I'm probably like, oh my god, just take the picture already. But it was a great seminar. So I had some great times in nonprofits, but that all came from this trip that I went to Swaziland in 2009 with the church I was going to at the time. And uh, it was a life changing trip for many reasons. One, because I hadn't been to Africa before, but also because um, we were working again with a lot of kids um, doing all that. But then seeing me, too, as a fellow black person who wasn't from there, they were like, whoa, let's hang out, let's get along, and it was just kind of cool, like a diaspora thing. Um, but also, like, it was just really cool to be around a country where people don't have a lot of life expectancy. Swaziland, I think the average age now is 38 years old. Um, that's because they had a, a huge AIDS epidemic, which is still going on, by the way. Um, so that's where we went to do some work there for a little while, but it was the most non-invasive work I've done, which was nice, because I don't really feel good about it afterwards. But a lot of that, all that to say is, it led to the We Charity stuff because I ended up going to university in Sweden and part of my research was about talking about communication theories, but while my other peers were talking about political science and all of that, I was like, I'm bored because at the time Canadian politics was extremely boring. I did not want to talk about that, but I did know nonprofits because between my you know my work in and church stuff, I volunteered at different nonprofits, I donated already, I had done stuff for World Vision, and I was like, well, this is stuff I'm interested in because it's more of an existential crisis. So I was like, what does this actually all mean? Does it mean anything? Am I doing any good or am I corrupting people, right? And so part of the my thesis on was on We Charity and basically on We Day and how they masterfully, by the way, use a lot of mass communication tactics to sway the opinion and money of young people, which is extremely hard to do. If you're in marketing, you know how much everyone wants the young people's opinion, vote, money, dollar, all of it. It's extremely hard to do that, and We Charity did that extremely well. Unfortunately, most of it was for the wrong reasons, in my opinion, and a lot of other people who work in nonprofits. Um, and so that work came about in this book. Um, I ended up winning um, an award in Sweden for best thesis, and I ended up going back for a talk in 2013 to talk about it, but essentially there were three main things about We Charity's work. One was the, was the concept of authenticity, where they're getting celebrities to come in and talk about their experiences when they would go on trips, celebrity sponsored trips, to Africa, to various parts of Africa, to various parts of Asia, and even South America. But it was very westernized and very sanitized, but also very much like, oh my god, I'm here, I'm drinking this blood, I don't know why. Jesse Crookshank, by the way, who I'm like, mm, sorry. I don't respect her. <laughs> Sorry. I watched that video so I like, cringe. I'm like, oh, girl. And now she's a mom influencer. Okay. Anyway. Um, she's still out here doing stuff. Um, and that was her shtick at the time because she was in Much Music VJ. But in that context of We Day trying to, per find a, trying to persuade young people to, to help with this thing, it was more like, you know, otherism. I mean, like, that person doing some weird stuff over there. We should go help them because we know what we're doing and they're not. 
that's but that's the premise of most organizations. Not it's not unique to the charity. Most organizations do, especially UNICEF, um, you know, Human Rights Watch. All these other organizations, in their inherent core, are like we are qualified to help those who are over there. Does that imply that they don't know what they're doing? These countries have been there for, the societies have been there for thousands of years in some cases. What makes you qualified to go over there and do that? Um, and then there's a, one of my favorite parts was ironic solidarity, which is an academic term, which basically is like, you feel like you're part of a big, big thing. And this goes for like churches and organizations and anything that makes you feel like you're a bigger part of something, because we all want to at the end of the day. That's human nature. The irony of that is that even though you feel like you're part of something, you're really acting in your own interest. You want to do this, you want to help the organization or help that child because it makes you feel good. Not necessarily because you're actually trying to help that other person, but because you want to feel good about it. And so you'll post about it, you'll talk about it. Not necessarily to raise awareness about that person's issue, but to say that I did the thing. You know, with people who help homeless people and record it, I hate that shit. It's so annoying <laughs> because if you just help people, more or less if you don't, it's like celebrities who announce this whole thing and you're like, just do the work. Like just go donate things. Like actually Beyonce's really good at this where she just gives money and doesn't say anything. <laughs> um, there are other celebrities like that. So in, in that sense, that's those are my core issues with me sharing that's what I'm writing about. Fast forward to 2020, the pandemic. Um, I'm waiting to move from my old place in the West End to my new place in Midtown. And I see that that week was a whole bunch of series of things where Justin Trudeau and Me Charity were entangled in some unsavory activity. And as a result, uh, We Charity really ended up getting dragged because a lot of people, there was a whisper network of people for years who did not like Me Charity's tactics um, because of what basically they ate into you know, the whole market share, but also because everyone realized what they were doing was not great. And so, um, when, when they finally got dropped by the government to do this campaign, or to do this um, program that they were supposed to uh, set up for young people, which I was like, you don't need to do this. I worked for a little organization that does this. The YMCA already had that network set up. They didn't need to do this. But because of the relationship, it wasn't good optics. So I tweeted this in 2020 while I was moving and kind of just went away, <laughs> which is one thing you don't do in marketing. You don't just like, um, tweet and drop it and walk away, you stay. <laughs> but when I came back, it was a whole bunch of people. I had a thousand new followers. People were like, yeah, we'd love to hear about it. Oh my gosh. And I was like, what? Uh, I didn't realize people would actually pull up and hear about this because I was like, I've been talking about this for eight years, but the reason why I didn't say anything was, A, they were basically giving me this is for anyone who, any dissenting opinions. But also because I published this in Sweden. So I was just like, well, it wasn't going to be here. It's not in Canadian archives. But also, I was like, well, this is a pattern that's been going on for a long time, and I haven't seen this coming. So it turned into the article, my first national article at Flair, which is now Fashion Magazine. Flair's gone, unfortunately. Um, but it was basically talking about, and that came through Twitter, by the way. Twitter is still good for connections, not necessarily anything else now. <laughs> but um, talk about corruption, you want to talk about Twitter? Anyway. Um, <laughs> So I wrote, I, I wrote this article summarizing my thesis, but also talking about why it's important to how Canadians see charity, because I feel like the pandemic really changed, corrupted the relationship between people and how they part with their money, especially because a lot of us were getting less of it. And we're like, if I'm going to give my money to this organization, I want to make sure I know where my money's going, that this situation is being helped, that someone is being helped, that it's not going to administration costs. Most organizations, like at least 60 cents on the dollar goes to admin costs. It does not go to the actual organization, which is why I prefer, when I do donate, it's why I prefer small organizations because most of the time it will go to the cause. Um, I end up, end up talking, doing a little media tour, which was kind of nuts from the, from the comfort of my couch. Um, I talked to Natasha Pata and a few other podcasters about my work and just about, in general, why you need to watch out for the various tactics of humanitarian organizations who have good intentions at heart, but then their tactics, not so great. So, um, but essentially, when it comes to nonprofits, corruption is a, is a breach of trust in people. It's more or less the organization, or the organization saying, we don't trust you enough to know enough, so we're going to impose this knowledge for you. It's not encouraging to look at, even just Google a couple more things. It's not encouraging people to really question why the tactic is what it is. They're saying, do this thing, and you'll do this, and then you go from there, which ironically is not the case. I need to explain that more. 
But it kind of segues into advertising marketing, which has been my bread and butter for a long time. Because um, it essentially is an exercise in psychology and persuasion. We are trying to get you, we're sending you messages to persuade you to do something, whether it's donate money, buy a product, feel good, recognize the brands that you eventually buy something, whatever else. But corruption gets involved in the process. So it's not to say that advertising people are corrupt, because we are not. <laughs> There's a lot of great people in marketing and advertising who just are doing a job at the end of the day. But sometimes the way that things are set up, there are a lot of avenues for corruption to creep in. For better or for worse, though, by the way. Sometimes there are good ways to be corrupt. <laughs> so in general, I'm a big fan of influencer marketing. I've been doing it for a long time. Um, and there are various aspects of it. It's kind of fascinating because it's still the Wild West in a lot of ways, where there is no regulation on how people get paid, how much children have to work. Because you see all these families, and you're like, how much are the children working? Are they getting paid? There are laws, but not for influencer marketing, right? Um, but at the end of the day, it's all about, you know, especially the smaller influencers, it's like, okay, you're making a relationship with me, but everything on social media is edited to a point. You're not getting the full story. You don't know how many times that shot was taken before they uploaded it. You don't know how many times it was photoshopped before you're told to do a beauty product. So three examples here is, one of my, actually this is one of my favorite influencers, she's actually a family. She was single before, then got married, and then had two adorable twin boys. I've been following her for at least maybe five, six, seven years. Her name is Cynthia Andrew. Um, and she's very honest about her stuff. Like a lot of her stuff is Instagram versus reality, which is pretty great. She travels a lot with those kids now, too. And it's hard traveling with any child, especially toddlers, and I appreciate her honesty about it. Um, I know some parents in here are like, oh my god, how the hell she do that? So it looks so good. But she's still like very honest about stuff. She acknowledges her approach and that she's able to do things and whatever else. And so that's where it's like, she acknowledges the corruption in the relationship with her, where she's like, I know these things don't appear as they really are. She tries her best to be like that, which is, I think, good. Um, that's good influencer marketing, where you're just mostly like being honest about what's really happening, even though to satisfy the algorithm beast, you have to present a front, you have to follow the rules or whatever else. But she's also saying, yeah, sometimes the kids don't want to take pictures, so I leave them out, it's cool, whatever else. And some parents are like, I'm taking my child completely off social media. So that's happening a lot now too, with de-influencing, that's happening with families. Then you have Kylie Jenner. Um, I'm not a fan of the Kardashians, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> for many reasons. I think they have actually corrupted society in a lot of bad ways. Um, we'll see because, but they're very, very good. I keep saying that Kris Jenner is probably the greatest marketer of all time because how would she get someone from a sex tape to a billion dollar empire? Listen, that takes skill, okay? I respect her for that at least. Um, but point at Kylie in general because her entire image is corrupted. That wasn't her real face for a long time. She did not grow up with that face. Everything is socially constructed. Everything is photoshopped. Her literal, there actually used to be, it's pretty funny, an old account called Jen, on, on Instagram called Kylie Jenner's Old Face. And they would post new pictures of her with her old face on it so that you would see the dramatic transformation. And then she's trying to sell you makeup. Get eyelashes like me. Get lips, get my lip kit. Get my cheeks, whatever else. None of it is real. And so that's, that's on the other spectrum where it's like, this is terrible influencer marketing because you're trying to attain something that is essentially unattainable, it's unrealistic. You'll never get there because you don't have tens of thousands of dollars to get plastic surgery, which is exactly what she got. And she was never, and I'm not, I don't condone, like plastic surgery, in essence, I think it's fine. If you talk about it, if you're very you know, open about it, Cardi B talks about it, a few other folks are very honest, like, hey, Dolly Parton, she's like, yeah, I got plastic surgery, I look great, whatever else. Be honest with it, it's cool, because sometimes you look great with plastic surgery. But in her case, then she never openly talked about it um, until that old account basically exposed her. And they had it taken down, by the way, because they knew what detriment it would be to her brand. So, um, I'll, I will get to this maybe a bit later, but one of my favorite accounts is Influencers in the Wild. <laughs> it actually shows the funny parts and the sad parts about influencer marketing. It shows a lot of people trying to make cool videos. There's people out in the world, like someone's taking a, a a video out in Spadina to look cool between all the traffic. There's a lot that goes behind that, and so much ridiculous. This account shows all of that. All that to say is like, it just shows how images are crafted and how brands are crafted in that. There's a lot of work that goes into that final image that you see on your screen, 
And the battle is for your attention. It's to get your thumb stopping stuff to really do that over time. So um, influence marketing is fascinating, but you know, huge grain of salt. A lot of it's not real. Um, so take that into account. It's a it's a real it's a real testament to how we consume everything too, and it's a way that you know, it kind of corrupts your perspective on things, even with all these filters, which are fun, but then now people are getting plastic surgery to, to, to mimic some of the filters that are, the features that are on filters. It corrupts your, your view of beauty, it corrupts your view of family life, it corrupts your view of being cool, it corrupts your view of what mental health looks like, what wellness looks like. Oh God, wellness is such a crazy, you wanna talk about corrupt industry, wellness. <laughs> Nothing on that is real. Everyone is just maybe starving themselves, and telling you to do this, that, and the other without doctor's advice, not cool. So, um, and then lastly, <laughs> who saw this picture and thought it was real? Oh, no. <laughs> I actually thought it was real too. Um, technology is a huge, is like, I love technology. I consider myself a futurist. I really love trying stuff out. Like I've been dabbing with ChatGPT as a and as a writer, I'm like, oh, I feel conflicted. Should I try this? No, it's it's an interesting tool to try it out. What I'm more concerned about is the way that we may end up using these tools to replace people completely, or just to interrupt our creative process to the point where we are not creative. We're not the chief creative anymore. It's the machine that's doing it. Um, and because we're feeding these machines with information and data, they are learning, and very quickly as well. That's why right now there's a, there's a call out for a moratorium on developing more, because someone's realizing, oh shit, we could be in big trouble here if we don't. It's also commercially motivated because a lot of them just want to get to it first and they want to make sure everyone's on the same playing field. So it's not all altruistic, they all just want to make sure that they get the money to it when it's time. But in general, this picture is fascinating to me because it really shows the way that someone did create this. They're just like, they were apparently high on mushrooms when they did this. I was like, wow, if you know when you're high on mushrooms, I'd love to see when you're, when you're sober. That's pretty cool. Um, and apparently it went viral because it was posted in a couple of groups. Um, and, but like I said, I thought it was real because until you see his hands and you realize it, it's, it's not long, his fingers are not long enough, and he's holding a Starbucks cup. I don't think the Pope would drink Starbucks. <laughs> I'm sorry, I know Starbucks is universal, but everyone's also, you know, he's living in Italy. Would you drink Starbucks in Italy? I don't know. Absolutely not. But in general, technology, I just want to say is like, it's, it is a great way to create things. It's a great tool. But the danger of corruption in creativity is coming up with these tools. So all that to say is like, keep using them and keep experimenting with them. I think there, there's been some fascinating work with Midjourney, with ChatGPT, with Dolly. Um, and it's kind of cool how it works our sense of, and it also, it's a mirror on ourselves, because what, what is in these language systems that it's drawing from to show us back, right? What is it? It's, it's really a reflection of the corruptions that we've done over the last, what, 80 years of stuff, um, and especially the last 30 years of internet, so I think it's very interesting. Um, so, are you corrupt? Yeah, probably. And I know, I'm being, so speaking of mirrors, I'm like, yes, I'm holding one up to all of us right now. Um, corruption is more about power. It's a power balance, power relationship, how we take advantage of it, and how we all use it to our advantage, even if we don't intend to. It's just the smallest decision where it's like, I'm gonna do this rather than this. And it doesn't necessarily have to be good or bad, it just is, right? Your motivation behind it is what makes it good or bad, but then what is good and bad? What's morality, right? Who defines that? Um, so there's an article I read from the Harvard Business Review about how you can kind of keep your own power in check. And everyone has a little bit of it that you can kind of use to your advantage, but also help other people. The first is, what can I do with my power? Just recognizing that you have it in the first place is a very powerful position to be in. And also corruption of thinking, because if you're thinking about your perspective, you're like, what do I do with this? I have influence over my kids, my partner, my family, my friends. What what do you have to offer? And part of relationships is about power, right? And so what are you doing or saying or thinking that can really affect someone else? Um, and how do you manage that, right? Even just with the simplest relationships. And, and this is outside of like work and creativity, but also with your creativity. It's like, what can I do with this power of creativity I have? Can I use it to just please myself? Which it should be a part of that. You should create stuff just for yourself. Some stuff you create should never be in the world because it's just for you. But then also just like, if I have this creative, if I have a voice, if I have a talent, how can I use that to benefit other people? Who, like, like Zika was saying, 
who can I serve, right? Um, what harm can I cause with my power? Because we can all cause some harm. It's human nature. Everybody can. And so are you putting somebody down? Are you not listening to them at all? Are you just not even being considerate of what your actions might do on something else? And that's essentially what the other bad corruption is, that it is inherently selfish behavior that takes no regard for what effect it might have on somebody else. That's why like with corruption in, in countries, like in, if you're saying, you know, like you guys were saying with Mexico, Chile, Colombia, it's just disregard for the people, right? And that's harmful. But what effects does it have over time? A lot of countries, including Canada, have still, we're still feeling the repercussions of corruption. Us with, with our native peoples, us with our, our relationship with, with Japanese folks who were interned in camps, or black folks that were put down, you know? We need to think about those, those harmful effects over time. And what can I do to stay humble? And it's kind of interesting to ask that question in a society where, you know, now we're even more encouraged to be selfish, talk about ourselves, which is fine to a point. You need to do that. But again, being in the service of others and being the collective of things is super important because staying humble means that you're like, okay, I can think about this, I can be considerate of other people, but keeping your power in check means staying humble. And that's super, super important to me anyway. So, um, but also, just to end off, <laughs> with our friend Elmo, this is how he handles, this is how he keeps his power in check. <laughs> Listen, the Sesame, Street, the Sesame Street content team is the greatest. They're so good. I, if I were to go back to the social media marketing full time, I'd want to work for the, the cartoon, the, the um, I think the Creeper Shop is what they call it. Don't worry, everybody. Elmo and Zoe practice sharing are still best buds forever. Elmo, we love you, Zoe. <laughs> Uh, but also he's like, I still want my crocodile. <laughs> you can't be both at the same time. So if that's how you end up being it, that's all. So thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Jill, let's give up one more time. Even just in your design work, 
be considerate of, you know, yes, we have rules around like say AOTA, where it's like when we design stuff, we have to be able to be mindful. But it also could be what I learned during the pandemic is being mindful of, you know, just having alt text and stuff, right? Where it's just like practicing where you need to have alt text in your images. It was a very like no one even social media, no one did it for a long time. It was very much disregarded. It was like, oh it's extra work. But now it's the situation of social media marketing. It's very important that you have you be mindful of who may not be able to access your content, right? And so it's just things like that where you have to be able to be mindful, or even just being mindful and considerate of something outside of yourself is how you really bring that into your practice. And as long as you do that, hopefully yourself will have repercussions. Um, I don't want to say, well, all these will change the world because, again, I'm a cynic. But in general, it's just more or less like if you do those small actions, they really do matter. They really, you have no idea how something you do affects somebody somebody else. Like even with, um, I'll say a quick example with my Mall UN, I ran the Mall UN club at my university, York University, Glendon College, whoop, um, for about four years. And I got a message a couple years ago from one of the one of the folks that was in the club. He's now a diplomat, um, serving on the Canadian Council in like Europe or something. He went to a meeting and he did the nicest message for myself, um, my vice president, and a few others who were administrating. And he was like, you guys, what you guys did in terms of like having us practice stuff, even just exploding this, this thing, thinking about different things, was why I'm able to do this job. And I was like, holy shit, that's crazy. It's not often someone comes back to and says thank you, but it, it was really touching just because, I mean, he was so great anyway, but also, I was just like, wow, you really went all the way. Like, you really did the thing that we were just pretending to do. <laughs> you were a real diplomat, we were just pretending to be diplomats. Uh, and so the fact that he, A, he came back and said thank you, but B, that he took what we thought was just running a club, he's like, no, this is part of my life. We're like, kind of crazy. So, hopefully that answers your question. Yes. Amazing, amazing. Okay. Uh, we have a question from someone who's watching us. Ooh, a live question. <laughs> People. Is it really short? Because we are like super okay. Okay. Um, any advice for women of color mm -hmm. on humility when the work world often overlooks us? Ooh. You said it was short. Resurrect has been dark for a bit, where I talk about marketing, 
brand name pop culture. It's called Put You On Game. It's on Substack. I believe it's on the Creative Warnings website, so if you want to get at that, subscribe and follow. Um, and I'm going to be restarting that. I had a, it was a short project that I wanted to do for myself. I realized I love doing it. And so I'm like, well, might as well restart it. This is a good time to do it. So you can follow me. Definitely Instagram is where I'm mostly active, though. So uh, and then stories, so that's where I cut up. So you can hang out with me there. Not so much Twitter anymore because Twitter is corrupted. Sorry. <laughs> give it up, give it up, give Thank it up. You.